Have you ever, uh, when you kids were growing up, or maybe when you were growing up, ever asked your parents why? How often you asked why? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? Why is this important? Why is that happening? Why is this taking place? And as a parent, you go, okay. Then you start coming up with answers to stop the whys. I, because I said so. Because that's the way we do it around here. So we don't really give an answer why as to what is happening. And from time to time, it's important that whatever we do, especially here at the church, uh, whatever we're doing, whatever is taking place, there are times where we need to be able to answer for people, why do you do this? If you brought a friend today, would you be able to tell them why we take communion? Why do we gather? Why even come here and to this place to ask, uh, to be able to answer that question of why? And it could be a significant difference in a person's life if you were able to say, this is why we do this. And sometimes it is because, well, it's just our tradition. Sometimes it's because that's the way the Lord is moving us to be able to do certain things. Um, So why is this series, Come Follow Jesus? I believe the Lord laid it on my heart last year and before that because what we are doing is trying, uh, God has called me to make disciples, okay? And to make disciples who then will be able to be trained to go out and make disciples. Because I can only do so much. But if you're able to disciple somebody and train them to be a disciple who can disciple somebody else, and brothers and sisters, you can do this. I know that you can do it because if I can do it, anybody can do it. It's not a difficult thing. It's just having the right information, the right knowledge to be able to do so. And that doesn't mean going to Bible college. You don't have to go to Bible college to get that information. You just have to be with Jesus. You have to pay attention to what Jesus is doing. And so to come follow Jesus is, uh, last year we did the story. Remember that? And so you can always go through the story with somebody. Going from Genesis to Revelation to help people understand who God is and what God was doing to help them with a biblical worldview so that, because that's significant. How do you make decisions? If you don't have a solid foundation upon which to make decisions about your life and about what you're going to do with your life, then you're just going to fly by the seat of your pants and you go, how come I keep making that dumb decision every time? How can I keep doing the same thing over again and keep coming up with the same result expecting something else to happen? Because we all go through that. Uh, And and so we have to have a a foundation of understanding of who God is and what He has done and what He expects of us and what He desires for us because He's a God of love and He reveals that to us. And He's revealed it to us in His Word. And so it's just a matter of getting into His Word. That's why you go through the story from... Genesis to Revelation, and we've got some books out, and I have a study that you could go through if you'd like to, or if you'd like to get involved in the training process and say, I want to be able to help train somebody. Maybe you've been in church for a long time, and all I can do is go start at the beginning, because if you understand from the beginning, not because you're at the beginning of your life spiritually, but you're at a place where you're going to try to help somebody who may be at the beginning to be able to move forward. And so that's the purpose of that study. The second study is come follow Jesus. Now we can go through the Gospels, and a lot of times people are asked to go through the Gospels just to discover who Jesus is. And we can do that. It's an important study to be able to understand who Jesus is, because then Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. Because I came to reveal the Father, God, to you, that's one of the reasons I came. Another reason he came was to train disciples who would then be able to train disciples after he left. Because in John chapter 17, he says, I I finished my mission, Father. Well, he wasn't dead yet. So what was the mission that he was on? He was training 12 men and more because there was one time 72 disciples went out on a mission 
So he, he, he had 12 that he was working with, but there were others that he was working with as well. So that when he left, he would give them the Holy Spirit so that they could go then and reproduce what he did with them. And so now we have a reproducible process that we can go through. If we study Jesus, how did he train them? What did he do with them? How did he, how did he work with them? And, and you can go through a whole list of things. He showed them how to do some things. He did some things, and then they came and asked, how do we do that? We see you doing this. How do we do that? And other times, he put them out in a boat in a storm just to find out what they're made of. Sometimes he puts you in a storm to find out what you're made of. And will you trust him? And will you, will you believe in him and have faith in him that he will bring you through the storm? And so that's the purpose of this Come Follow Jesus series, is to pay attention to what Jesus is doing, brothers and sisters, so that you can then re replicate, duplicate, learn how he did it so that you can then do it to somebody else, to help them grow in maturity in Christ. Paul says in uh, Colossians chapter 1, 28 and 29, and that's my life verse right now, it's changed over time. One time, it used to be Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Important verse. And there were other times, it was, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I even used that as my password. I no longer use that. <laughs> but I had that as my password to remind me of who I am. I am a been created in Christ Jesus. I'm a brand new creation, and he has given me a job to be an ambassador of his to the world. He reconciled me to Jesus, through Jesus, to the Father, and now he has given me the job. And that's why 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through the end of the chapter, because that includes everybody. You've been made a new creation. Therefore, you are now an ambassador for Christ. So you've got to learn how to be an ambassador. And that's why we're going through this particular study. Today... And he changed the world. There's some things Aaron and I were listening to a, a, uh, a webinar this week. And um, in the webinar, one of the things they said, 87% of young people, so you go about 15 years to 30 in that ballpark, don't go to church because they don't see it as relevant. And when they do come, they don't understand what in the world is going on. And so we don't explain anything as to why we do this. What are we doing? How are we doing this? And how can, how can we begin to reach them? Because the, we got to answer the question, why the church? Why church? And if we can't answer that question, we're going to have a lot of people wandering around out there. Well, they go to church and they don't even understand why they go to church. Do you understand why you go to church? Part of it's the fellowship. Part of it's, I need you. You inspire me uh, to be able to stay true, to stand firm. And we need one another to encourage one another to stand firm when the storms get big. That's what part of the church is about. We're, we're a body. And when you hurt, I hurt. When you have joy, I have joy. Because there's this relationship going on more than just God and me. It's now horizontal between you and me and one another and that's one of the reasons the church is so important but then the church as a group has been called to go and break down the gates of hell and rescue as many people as we can but we can't do that alone that's why the one of the other reason why the church is so significant so important so we need to be able to answer the why how can we encourage one another? There's like 13 one another's, maybe more than that. Meet, one, meet together one another, love one another, care about one another, bear one another's burdens, submit to one another, love, uh, and so forth. Encourage one another. But you can't do that if we're not one anothering together. How can I encourage you if we're not face to face? How can you encourage me? Or somebody sitting next to you. How can we help when somebody's having a bad, going through a bad time? 
That's also, it's not, it goes beyond these doors. It goes beyond this place because we remain the church wherever we go so that we can help someone who's in need and, and going through difficulty. So today, today's message is, is taking a look at what Jesus had to teach about forgiveness. And he's training these disciples to understand what forgiveness is all about so that we can then forgive one another as he has forgiven us. Now, forgiveness is one area that Satan, let me put it this way, unforgiveness is one of the strongholds that Satan puts in Christian people's lives. Yeah, Christian people's lives. Because something has happened in their life somewhere a long time ago or whatever, might have been just yesterday. Because if I knew you well enough and I could bring up a certain name, that name would cause you to go, that's unforgiveness. And it hits the church and it hits all of us. We all, that's something we battle all the time because somebody could slight us or forget us or not call us when we were sick or not whatever is going on and therefore we blame the whole church and we become unforgiving and bitter. And we need to understand that Satan wants to steal your joy and he will do it through those kinds of things. He wants to kill your desire for any relationship. I've met people who, although they start a relationship, they kill the relationship because they've been hurt so many times in other relationships. They're going to do whatever they can to hurt you before you hurt them because of unforgiveness. It's not just personal, but it's unforgiveness for the whole human race because whatever happened in their growing up or past, they can't forgive. And so Satan kills the desire for any relationship, for anything meaningful, anything that's long-lasting, and to destroy any hope of reconciliation between you and someone else, that there wouldn't be any reconciliation because the pain's too deep. The unwillingness to forgive what someone has done has placed a, will place you in a dungeon of unhappiness. It will. And you made the dungeon. Because, see, the person who did whatever they did to you didn't make and create the dungeon. When you decided to not forgive, that's when the dungeon was made. See, they don't have any power to steal your happiness or joy. Satan doesn't have that power. We just give it up. Because we get emotionally connected to our pain and we put another brick on the wall. Jesus says that he has promised to fill us with a joy so completely we sang a song, Joy Unspeakable, 1 Peter 1.8. I sent out a message on Facebook. Do you, do you have joy unspeakable in your life? Every Christian should. Every believer should have joy unspeakable in their life because of what Jesus has done, not because of what, let's see, whose name haven't I used recently? Let me just say, me. It doesn't matter what I've done to you or not done to you. Because sometimes some people didn't do something and we get hurt. And it comes from an unforgiving heart. But Jesus promised that we'd have joy unspeakable. He promised that if you remain in him and he remains in you, that his joy will be made complete in you. How many have had that joy made complete? For a long time. Or have you forgotten what that joy feels like? What about the peace that passes all understanding? So no matter what the storm is, you like Paul can fall asleep in a boat when the storm's raging. Because you have peace that passes all understanding. 
Now, you can't manifest it. You can't make it up. You can't make it happen. You can't create your own joy. You can't create your own peace. It only can come through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. But let me say, why is this important? I've seen unforgiveness by followers of Christ split and tear churches and families apart because of ego and pride, not because of God's Word. They put the stamp of God's Word on it, but it's not. It was ego and pride or personality conflicts, self-centeredness. An unforgiving heart over the years creates physical problems and emotional problems. That's medically proven. And yet, we do all kinds of things, like drink Dr. Pepper. I do have some people that have lived to be 90 plus that drank Dr. Pepper, and I said, man, if I drink more than they do, I might live to be 150. But that doesn't work that way, you see. It doesn't work that way. But there are things that we could do that are unhealthy. We know that to be true. But unforgiveness is unhealthy. We can see just in the last two years the social problems that are the result of unforgiveness. Take a look at all the riots that have taken place and all the things that they say are the problems resulting from why they rioted in the first place. And it all comes up to one word, unforgiveness. I'm not saying none of that happened. I'm just saying unforgiveness is the backbone to the rioting. The bitter root that takes hold in a spiritual life and leads to pain physically. It doesn't lead to the pain, but medically they have learned that someone who is bitter, that pain is enhanced and made more. They feel it to a greater extent than someone who is not bitter or unforgiving. It's interesting. It ruins relationships because an individual is ungrateful for what the person's able to do because they're not doing everything that they used to do in a similar situation. But it's not similar at all. But they become bitter and resentful. Now people notice everyone around a bitter person knows that bitter person is bitter. You know what I'm saying. You can hear it in their voice. You can hear it how they talk to others or about other people. They spew their bitterness to anyone who will listen. And, and this is where we're at. We're, we're in need of a spiritual surgery to dig through His Word and let His Spirit work in our life so that the blockage of the spiritual life that needs to flow in all of us can be taken out. So a person's unwillingness to forgive whatever has happened or happening right now is stealing your joy. It's a blockage in your heart, spiritually speaking. It's killing you from the inside out. In years, of, years from now, I guarantee that if you think about it, you're going to be really disgusted with yourself that you let whatever happened 40 years ago still control your emotions. Because I guarantee you that person 40 years ago doesn't give a rip about it. They don't even remember. But boy, we remember, don't we? And we're living without joy because of that. So all the while we could have been set free. All the while we could have been experiencing this incredible, unspeakable joy that God wants to give us through Jesus Christ and through a relationship with Him and through the Holy Spirit in you because, again, it's not something you can make. You can't create the joy. You can't create the love that God is calling you to do. He, you can't create patience. You, don't even ask for patience. You can't make it happen. But one thing I can tell you the truth, you've been given the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace, joy, love, patience, kindness, goodness, 
self-control, long-suffering. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit that He's given to you. So claim the gift. Thank you, Lord, for making me patient with my husband. Thank you, Lord, for making me patient with my kids. Because He's already given you the tools. Right? Isn't that the truth? But we've been taught that we should pray for patience and I don't really see that anywhere. You've already been given it to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So now let's live in the power of the Holy Spirit so that no matter what happens, the Spirit is moving in us. We'll have incredible joy. We'll have uh, peace that passes all understanding. Have you ever felt that? That's a promise. And every Christian should be experiencing peace that passes all understanding. But there's a means to that. Gratitude is the means. Praying with gratitude in your heart brings peace that passes all understanding. Check it out. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. And what you think about has a lot to do with the joy and a lot to do with the peace. Because if you think about whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever... Not whatever is negative, not whatever somebody's hurt me with, not whatever is going on. You know, you follow what I mean? When we start thinking negative, we start losing the joy. But when we start thinking about what Christ has done for us. So that brings us to the story. In Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, Peter comes to Jesus after Jesus has this little bit about forgiveness And he says, he's coming magnanimous. You know, he's thinking he's really caught this whole thing about forgiveness. And he says, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? Is seven times enough? You get that? Some people can't even forgive after one little deal. But Peter's going, I'm I'm the man. I got it. Seven times. And Jesus says, you don't even come close. How many times did he say you should forgive? You, you guys read your Bible. I'm awesome. That's awesome. I mean, you're awesome. That's great. 70 times 7. That's 490 times. You know, I think by the time you got the 10 or 12 or 30, uh, 490 times is way out there. Like, by that time, you're not even... Yep, yep, you're forgiven because it's no longer touching you. It's not longer getting into you. But then Jesus says, now here, I told you 70 times 7, but here's what it is. Living in my kingdom is like this. There was a king who once had a slave who he was going to make an accounting for. He was bringing all of his servants in to make an accounting, all right? And one of those particular servants had a debt of 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. Now, I've heard that explained many times as to what, how much is talent. And one person explained a talent as 15 years wages. 15 years wages. How much do you make in 15 years? Now multiply that by 10,000. We have a word that we've made up for a whole bunch. It's called a gazillion. We don't even know what a gazillion is, but we've made up a number that says it's a gazillion. He owed him that much. There is nobody in their right mind or in their own way, or no matter what they do, they can't even hit the lottery and pay off a gazillion. Nothing. This debt is said to be insurmountable. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment. But the king says, until you repay this, if you don't repay this, I'm going to sell you, I'm going to sell your child, I'm going to sell your wife, I'm going to sell your donkey, I'm going to sell everything you have just to recoup some of the things that you owe me. Because he didn't have enough. Imagine going home and saying, boy, we got to pay back a gazillion And your wife goes, but you were given 10,000 talents. What did you do with it, you dummy? 
Didn't you invest any of it to be able to get anything of that back? No, I just spent it all. On what? What did you spend it on? That's not even a word, spend it, did it. So. But until you pay it back, I'm going to sell everything you have. You and your family is in debt. They're going to be slaves forever. For generation upon generation upon generation, they're going to be in debt forever. And the man falls down on his knees and cries out to the king and says, please have mercy on me. I will pay back whatever I owe. The king is going to blow his mind. And Jesus is going to blow everybody's mind in the story when he says he had compassion upon the man. And when he had compassion upon the man, he said, get up. You do not owe me anything anymore. He just forgave gazillions. Who's going to pay it? The king. The king's paying off the debt. So he doesn't owe anymore. Sound familiar? To our story? Between us and Jesus? You see, before you came to Christ, you owed a gazillion in sin. And you could never ever, no matter how long you ever lived, would you ever be able to pay it back to be able to set free, to be set free, to be debt free. And when you came to Christ, you came to him in repentance and saying, I can't pay off this debt. I can't, I, I repent of my sin. I, I want to, I need to be, I can't pay it. I can't, it's too much. And Jesus says, in Colossians chapter 2, 11 and 12 and 13, I've nailed your debt to the tree, the cross upon which I died. That means your debt is canceled. You no longer owe anything. You see, you, the, the world says you owe, you pay. And if you don't pay, you lose. You lose it all. Somebody's going to come and repossess your life if you owe them anything. But in God's thing, you owe, he pays. He paid the whole thing. Now, how do we act? See, that becomes part of the story. This is still the story going. How do we act when we've been forgiven so much? And we pray, Father, forgive me of my sin. And then we meet George. The servant went out. He was happy that he didn't owe anything anymore. But he met somebody who was another slave who owed him, it says, a hundred denarii. Ten bucks. He owed him ten bucks. Gazillion, ten bucks. And he went over and grabbed him by the throat and said, Pay me back my ten dollars. And the guy said, just give me some more time, and I will, get, I will find a way to get you the $10 and pay you back. And he's choking him the whole time and says, you, you, I'm taking you to debtor's prison. He threw him into prison, said, you're not getting out until you give me that 10 bucks." And he went on his way. Forgiven a lot. His debt paid, and then when he had a neighbor or a friend who owed him something, he couldn't forgive it. Now, the story goes on that the man, other slaves, saw what was going on. He heard, went and told the king, and the king heard of it, called the man in, and said, um, you would think that if you received the kind of grace that you received, that you would have been able to forgive what somebody else owed you. But since you can't do that, I'm selling your kids and I'm selling your wife into slavery. I'm selling everything that you have into slavery because unless you forgive as you've been forgiven, there's no forgiveness left. 
So what is the Holy Spirit? What is the Father calling us to do? Let me, let me tell you what's blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit in most people's lives who follow Jesus. It's one of the things is sin. The other thing, which is sin, it's under the label of sin, but it's unforgiveness. Either one of those is going to steal your joy. And you might feel happy here once in a while, but you're never going to have this unshakable joy, uh, undisturbable peace in your life until you can go to the Father and say, Father, I need you by your Spirit to investigate my heart. Because there appears to be a blockage that's keeping me from knowing the full flow of the Holy Spirit. And will you reveal that to me so that I can release it and forgive with my heart? Because Jesus says, unless you do the same and forgive those around you from your heart, the same will happen to you in the story. I think all of us want to know the flow of the Holy Spirit in our life. So full, so flowing. You have to examine your own heart, your own life. Is there anything in your life that you're not being able to forgive? That you're holding a grudge on? That you wrote down on a list in your heart? It says, when I meet this person, this person owes me. And boy, am I going to blast them when I see them. Or I'm going to give them the silent treatment. I'm not going to talk to them at all. (laughs) That's going to get them. Because I can't forgive what my husband did, what my wife did, what my child has done, what my neighbor has done, what my co-worker did, what my people that I spend time with. I hope you won't be like my uncle. Actually, a great uncle. He's passed away, and I I don't know what his status is. But something happened in the family with his 13 other brothers, 12 other brothers and sisters. And he was unable to forgive them, and he wouldn't have anything to do with them for 20 years. That's miserable. It impacts families for years. Because of something that's happened in the past. Now, I don't have enough time to go into some some other particulars. Forgiveness doesn't mean you give them the right to everything in your life. There's some things that whatever they've done, you've got to say, I forgive you. And I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to pray for you. But for right now, we're going to have to kind of walk the line a little bit. I'm not going to build a wall. See, this is what happened with Paul and John, Mark, and Barnabas. They went out on a mission trip. And John Mark did something on the mission trip that was hard. And he left Paul and Barnabas in the middle of the mission trip, and he went home. When they come back to do another mission trip, Barnabas wanted to take his cousin, John Mark, back on to go back. And Paul put up a fuss. And you go, Paul, how come you haven't forgiven John Mark? If you forgave John Mark, you should let him come along with you again. You see, I believe Paul did forgive John Mark. But see, Paul was looking after the church and said, John Mark did something with the church up there that I can't bring him up there yet because they are too young. They're not mature enough to handle John Mark coming back yet. And so, and John Mark's not mature enough. So he can't come back with us. I forgive him, but he can't come back with us for now. So Barnabas says, okay, do you mind if I take John Mark with me and go somewhere else? This isn't in the story. I'm making it up. Okay, But it's actually happened. Barnabas took John Mark to another place to start a church. And Paul took Silas with him back to the churches that they had started. 
Every, every John Mark who has messed up in their life needs a Barnabas. That's true. Paul forgave John Mark, but there, he just was not ready to be able to go back to do anything with this thing. But understand this, because John Mark grew up, later in a letter by Paul, he says, send John Mark to me because he's useful for me. See, some people just need time to grow up. They're not ready to get back involved to do the stuff that's going on. So there is, in the measure of forgiveness, where we have to allow time for things to take time to build the relationships back up again. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so much for your word, and I pray that if there's anybody here today that has come, that has had their spiritual lives blocked, either because of sin they're currently living in or because of unforgiving heart, that you would come upon them with your spirit because they can't forgive unless you give them the power to forgive. Fill them with your presence and your spirit so that they might feel the flow of, of the joy, of peace, of the fruit of the spirit flowing within them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's come together and sing our song of invitation while they're coming up. For those who don't know the name Corey Ten Boom, this is so old. I mean, it's back in World War II. But Corey Ten Boom has a book that was written before she passed away called The Hiding Place. And her and her family in the Netherlands were hiding Jewish people from the Nazis. But then they were discovered doing this, so her and her whole family were taken to the gulags, the prisons, where everybody in her family died, except for her. She had gone back to Germany, invited to go back to Germany to, to share with the church and, and share her testimony and talk about the love of God. After the service was over, there was a gentleman that came up with his hand outstretched and saying, I'm so grateful that because you know Jesus that you have forgiveness. And then she recognized him. He was one of the guards who had watched them strip and go into the showers and gawked at them, her and her sister and every, all the other women, and abused them in multiple ways. And he reached out his hand and asked her if she would forgive him because he had become a Christian. He knew everything he did was wrong. And Corey says that she couldn't. Pain is too deep. But she knew she had to. And it says, she wrote in her book that she prayed, Father, I can't forgive him on my own, but I need the presence of your Holy Spirit to come upon me so that I can reach out and forgive him. And she wrote in her book that as she reached out her hand to reach his hand to bring forgiveness, there was a power that came over her to be able to move her hand to his that she could only say was by the Holy Spirit because she couldn't move it. But this energy from within, the Holy Spirit reached out and said, only by the presence of God and the Holy Spirit can I give this forgiveness to you. That's why I say you can't forgive some things because you don't have the power or the ability to do so without the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. And so you have to keep trusting him and keep working in him and keep asking, give me what you have given me. So it starts, what did he give you? Didn't he pay your debt completely? Which part of the story are you in that Jesus told? Are you the one that's been forgiven and can't forgive? Or are you the one that was forgiven and now is able to forgive just such a tiny debt compared to what you owe to God? 
I want you to know the freedom and the joy of the Holy Spirit in your life on a daily basis. But if you're not, you've got to do some examination because there's probably something in there that you are holding and still have a bitter root that needs to be uprooted and taken out by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because I can't do that for you. Only God can. May you be set free so that you too can have that joy. Let's sing. Thank you.